Hi guys, this is Mrs. Gessler, and in this video, we're going to talk about some applications of circular motion, uniform circular motion. And before we do that, we're going to talk about some pro tips, uh, because there are some things that when you do them, <laughs> they're bad, and they'll help you confuse yourself and make things harder. Uh, so don't do them. Um, okay, so my first one is about the forces um, when you are trying to answer questions about uniform circular motion, and it's a difficult one. So like the, the horizontal circles, when you just have something moving around on a surface, like a turntable or whatever, um, those are pretty easy because you only have one dimension to worry about, and the thing is either going in a circle or it's not. Uh, and the centripetal force is what you're worried about, okay? And then what's causing it and what's not. Um, vertical circle um, gets a little bit more complicated because the, the centripetal force stays the same, but what's causing it and contributing to it changes. So it's just gravity or it's gravity and the tension, or but the centripetal force stays the same and either those forces are pointing in the same direction or they're pointing in opposite directions. And so um, that my hands didn't match what I just said, but it's fine. Uh, and so you have to think about what's happening and when and where it is, um, but the centripetal force is still pointing towards the center of the circle, okay? Um, with these applications, we're talking about things that are a bit more complicated, so we'll have something that's spinning in a circle like this, like it's hanging and swirling around, which is far more likely to actually happen, okay? Um, or it's, um, in, in real life, um, if you go to watch a um, a car race, um, or you're driving down the highway and you're going around a turn, you might notice that the, the roadway is actually curved, um, and that, that's called an embankment. Um, that's a real-life application of circular motion, um, somewhere we would, we would put that. So we might, we might need to think about those things. And so what happens is that in the plane of the circle, so vertical, horizontal, wherever that circle, circular motion is, the sum of the forces in that plane is going to be the centripetal force. Okay, that's what's going to be causing it. So you might have to think about what's causing that force, but that the sum of those forces are going to be causing that centripetal force. Anything that's perpendicular to that plane is going to be zero. Okay, if this were a more advanced AP class, um, it might be going some other way. It might be moving, but as long as it's not accelerating, the net force is going to be zero. So the car, when it's going around that banked curve, as, lo as long as it's not going up off the curve or down lower, then the sum of the forces is going to be zero. Okay. Um, when you're drawing a free body diagram, uh, draw one. <laughs> That's the first thing you need to do. Um, and then make sure that your angles are comically large or small. Um, as an example, um, I was working a problem earlier. Yeah. The one I'm going to give you as an example, I didn't draw. Actually, this one, I did fix it. I drew my angles similar to the picture, and then when I was working on it, I didn't draw it well enough that I couldn't tell where my angles were, and I got myself all confused, and I had a wrong answer, okay? Um, the more exaggerated you make your angles, it doesn't matter if your picture is accurate in, the, in scale, it matters if you know what you're talking about. Uh, and so if your 45 degree angle looks like this, <laughs> at least you know where the 45 degree angle is, although if it's 45 degrees, it doesn't matter, right? If it's a 40 degree angle and it looks like this, 40 degrees, perfect. Now you know where the 40 degree angle is, right? And so you're not going to get it mixed up with the other, the other angle, which is 50 degrees. Uh, it's not going to get, you're not going to end up with a wrong answer, okay? Um, some common forces that you're probably going to see in your free body diagrams are going to be gravity, tension, friction, and normal. Um, most of the time, those are the forces that you're going to be dealing with, uh, unless you're talking about atoms, in which case it's probably going to be um, an electric force. Uh, that you might be added on there, but we don't learn about um, electric forces in AP Physics 1 anymore, so you might not have to do that, okay? Um, you're probably going to have at least two, maybe three, um, probably not all of those at the same time, but it could be. Um, if you are struggling with your trig, write it out, okay? On your equation sheet, they're right there. You don't have to have them memorized. If you get them mixed up, they're right here, okay? Um, the equation sheet has all sorts of interesting things. If you're looking for the circular motion equations, they're here. And then if you combine this with this, you can get F equal FC equals MV squared over R, which is very useful uh, in solving some of these equations. Okay. There's also some values right here if you needed them on the other side. Okay. Um, and that's it for my pro tips. Okay, so we're going to do some, some questions. First, this one is called... A conical pendulum. I don't think they'll ever refer to it as a conical pendulum in any of the problems, so knowing its name doesn't really matter. Uh, here is the tension in the string. 
uh, is along here. This is a ball. It's being swirled around on this circle. This is just a stick that holds it up. Um, they'll either give you an angle or a length or a radius, but probably not all of those, uh, and that's fine. Uh, here is what um, a Fourier body diagram of all the forces that are acting on it, that is like to scale with the picture, um, but you can see how I might have mixed my angles up here um, because I, I, that does, I, I can't really tell. If I switch my, my triangles around, it's kind of easy. Here's the tension, here's gravity, okay? Tension always follows the string, okay? Um, the question that we're going to go through here has to us to derive an expression for the mass of the ball. <laughs> okay. So when I, when I think about deriving the mass of the ball, I, I know I'm going to have to look at this gravity here because that's got mg, right? mg. Okay. So I, I need to be looking in the y direction. Okay. So when I think about this, uh, the first thing that I know, um, remember that, um, the, some of the forces in the per the perpendicular to the plane direction is going to be zero. So I know that f here and here have to be equal. So, um, in this free body diagram right here, I have this, this is my exaggerated angle. So I can tell where the angles are a little bit better. Here is that angle. It's a lot easier to see right now. Um, that angle is right there. Okay. So, so I know that the net force in the Y direction are zero. So from that, I can tell that the, the Y, T Y, this side of the triangle is going to be equal to that, um, that force gravity. So T, oh, I look over here. So T Y, which is that side of the triangle here, cosine is what links this adjacent side to the hypotenuse. So there, and so I write it like that. T cosine theta equals MG. You can go away. Uh, and when I rearrange that for M, this is the formula to get. This is a theta. It just looks really crummy. Okay. So there is an expression for the mass of the ball. Okay. Now the next one I need to do is to derive an ex expression for the speed of the ball. And in order to do that, I need to know that that FC equals MV squared over R, um, which is a combination of F net equals MA and uh, AC equals V squared over R. Um, and I know that um, because the net force in the direction, the plane of the circle is the centripetal force, then I really just need to look at that um, Tx side of the, that's x, of the triangle here. Okay, and so that's what I'm going to do. So I need this side of the triangle, which I think I wrote right here. Yeah, there it is. So the sine of the theta equals Tx over T. So I solved for Tx using that, and so that's what I'm gonna do right there. And so I stuck that in for M, for the FC, uh, and I need to find V squared, so I'm gonna do some math here. So, uh, oh, and I stuck in my expression for M, see, M, there it is right there. And, uh, and so I just stuck it in, and now I'm gonna do a little bit of math algebra here. Um, so my T's canceled out, and I multiplied by R, and then I'm gonna multiply by G. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but sine over cosine is, um, is tangent. Um, sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And when you cancel out the over hypotenuses, you get opposite over adjacent, which is tangent. And so I replaced that. <laughs> so RG tangent of theta is V squared. So I just square rooted all of that, and here is my expression for velocity in terms of r and g and theta. Now, what if the question had asked me to do it in terms of l? Uh, well, I would have had to write something else in there. Okay, um, r uh, is of this side, and l and theta. So I could get I could get l in terms. I could switch from r to l, right, using some more tan, some more trig functions. And so I wrote a little note here. Uh, caution, make sure you use the terms given in the problem. So if it, if it doesn't give you R, don't leave this in terms of R, okay? You have to use whatever, whatever the test tells you to do, okay? So you'll need to pay attention to what the test is telling you to do, okay? So this is a conical pendulum. Uh, you might be asked to find the force. You might be asked to find the mass, the radius, any kind of things, depending on what they want you to do, okay? Um, this is a conical pendulum. It's loads of fun. All right, um, that's it for that question. Next question is about another application, which is that embanked curve I was telling you about. Okay, so these are fun. Uh, so we have a car. This is kind of a drawing of it. See, whoosh, there it comes. Okay, a car rounds a curve on an embanked road. Um, this is a car, see? And now it has a, there you go. Okay. It's a, there's a driver. It's like a, 
It's like an armored vehicle, okay, rounding a curve. Uh, it's got some angle on it, okay, and we want to derive an expression for the centripetal force when there is no friction, okay. Um, when there is no friction, um, the, ma the, uh, the free body diagram that we would draw looks like this. So this would be the force of gravity, and this would be the normal force on the car. And since there is no friction, that would be the only forces on the car. I mean, there might be some, uh, uh, you know, the, the engine pushing the car forward, but that would be coming out this way. Um, but these are the forces that would be mattering at the moment, okay? Uh, and then I drew the angle right here. You can see I've got the this. I, I exaggerated the angle here because this angle is going to allow me to inadvertently get my angles in the wrong place. Uh, and I didn't want to do that, okay? And so um, when there's no friction, the centripetal force is just going to come from this part of the normal right here, the, that normal in the x direction. Uh, and so the normal, um, I need this part of the normal. I need to figure out what the normal is. Uh, and I'm going to get that from the y value here. So since there's no acceleration going up or down, I know that the, the net force in the y direction is zero. So fg is going to be this side of the triangle right there. And so, oh, I redrew that triangle right here with my exaggerated angle. So there's my angle right there and F and X and FG on this y, y side and there's my normal. And so I wrote down an appropriate function. I don't actually know FN, but I do know this side of the triangle, so, which is FG. So FN Y um, is right there. I didn't actually finish filling this out, did I? Okay, let me, let me do that really fast. Okay, so Fn y is going to be m times g times the tangent of the angle. So right there, that is my centripetal force for a car going around a banked curve. Now this next one is not nearly as pretty. Um, here's my advice to you on this one. It is very unlikely that uh, the AP physics test is going to ask you to derive such a thing. So if you just want to watch and follow along or stop the video now, um, maybe you like deriving equations and this is really cool to you and then you keep watching. Um, that's great. And maybe you are so um, anxious and, and watching me derive equations just makes you really uncomfortable. And in that case, you should stop watching and that's okay. Um, I, don't, I, I don't remember any of the problems asking you to do this. I think most of them are a lot simpler than this um, anyway, but if, if you need to, you can always come back. It's not like the video is going to go away. Um, but I'm going to go through a, der a derivation for the centripetal force. Oops, I lost my picture. Um, for the centripetal force when there is friction um, involved. Okay, so so what does what does the centripetal force look like um, on a car going around in a baked curve when there's friction helping to keep the car from falling off the road? Okay falling off the road. <laughs> uh, it's not pretty. Okay. Just a, just a heads up. It's uh, it's kind of involved. Lots of algebra. Okay. So if you like algebra, good for you. I like algebra. Uh, and so to start with, um, we can just look at the picture. Um, actually looking at the picture is a good idea. Um, so I didn't add it in yet, but here's what it looks like. So I still have FG and I still have the normal force, but now I have friction. Uh, and my car, if I'm going too fast, my car is going to try and slide up outwards, right? This is what's going to happen. So friction is going to be pushing me back down. Okay, so friction would be right here. And the type of friction that it is, this is going to be really weird, is static friction. Because it's trying to hold me in place on that circle. Okay, I'm still moving this way and that way, but this way I'm not moving. Okay, so this is a, a type of static friction, a static friction in this direction. I might still have kinetic friction going this way, um, but not that way. So that's static friction. And now there's an alarm going off. Okay. And so what I know is that the net force in the y direction is zero, but this time it includes a lot more um, things because there's a part of this friction that's in that direction. So instead of just having G and N and those balancing each other out, I have G and F in the Y direction um, that's balancing out the normal in the Y direction. But they still add up to zero because it's still not going up and down. Okay. And there's my F. Um, I added an F picture right there. And so um, actually I'm going to come back and expand these a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so we're gonna come here. So my centripetal force is also no longer just the normal, it's the normal plus part of friction. So those, the normal is pushing it in and the, the friction is also pushing it in. So that looks like this. 
So now I'm just going to do some trig stuff with my with my um, with my triangle. So that part of the normal that's the x is fn times the sine, and that part of the friction um, that's in the x direction is f times the cosine because these angles are in different places. Do you see? You see how my triangles are different? Um, so I don't use the same trig function for both of those. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm really just kind of replacing stuff as they go. So, so I'm going to do the same thing with my, my y direction. So Fn um, in the y direction is cosine, um, g is just mg, and f in the y, the friction in the y direction is times the sine. Okay. And so what I do here is I just keep going and I'm just kind of simplifying and replacing things when I can. The next thing I did was I replaced friction with mu times the normal. I don't have a clue what the normal is, um, and so I just keep going. Um, in fact, over here, once I do that, um, actually here I'm kind of stuck because I don't, I don't have a clue what the normal is. Um, and over here though, I can, I can sort of keep going. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this and I'm going to kind of solve it for the normal. Okay. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to move everything that has a normal in it to one side and everything that doesn't over here. I'm going to take out the normal and put everything together in parentheses, and then I'm going to divide by that junk so that I have the normal equals junk, okay? We're gonna totally call that junk. And then I'm gonna take this junk <laughs> and I'm gonna stick it over here. But first I'm gonna put the normal off by itself like I did over here. So I have normal times junk. And I'm gonna put this junk in for that normal. This is ugly, right? I told you it was ugly. Okay, so the normal Here's the junk that I plugged in. Okay, see, I put this, I put this here, and I put this junk on the bottom, and this junk is still right there. So I have all this ugly junk, and that is the centripetal force. That's an expression for the centripetal force when there is friction. It's ugly, but I was able to do it um, in terms of variables. Okay, so I've got mass which is the car. I've got G, which is a known, um, the angle, which is right there. And then whatever the static friction between the car and the road is, um, which is everything that I could put in there. It's not pretty, but it gets the job done. Okay. Um, if you like friction or I'm sorry, if you like algebra, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and those are just some applications of what you can do with, um, some complicated <laughs> applications of what you can do with uniform circular motion. If you have questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.